Greetings, Fuel Brothers. Welcome back to this Thursday session of Vieira Fuel. I have a special treat. We've got one of our own, Lance Burry. He's been one of our Fuel Brothers and come into our meetings, and he had something special on his heart he wanted to share with us. Uh, he moved here into Vieira in 2021, and he's got a background in law and tax law. And he's going to bring a very special message, the two most important questions in life. Give a hand for Lance Burry. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. So normally I might start out a, a talk with something humorous and entertaining, but instead I'm going to talk about something that's pretty inspirational, and that was the 1983 North Carolina State NCAA champions coached by Jimmy Valvano, Jimmy V. So that team was 10 and 7 going into the ACC tournament and they needed to beat Michael Jordan's North Carolina team and Ralph Sampson's Virginia Cavaliers team in order to win the ACC tournament to get an automatic bid because with seven losses there was no way they were going to get in. And I think at that time it was 53 or 54 teams that got into the tournament. So if you watch, and I would encourage you to do so, the ESPN 3030, the improbable, miraculous, miraculous come from behind victories that they had is truly amazing, right? And it's truly a God thing. And he was a man of God. And he's probably most famous for Jimmy V about 10 years after they won the NCAA tournament. He was dying of cancer. He received an ESPY award from ESPN. They set up a charity, and when he was giving his acceptance speech and encouraging people to donate to the Jimmy V Foundation, he said, never give up, never give up. He said, cancer may take my body, but it can't take my mind, it can't take my soul. And so never give up is what he's most famous for. But in that 30 on 30 presentation, he also said something that's very relevant to everyone here today. He said, God must love ordinary people because he's created so many of us. <laughs> and he says, God created ordinary people so through them he could do extraordinary things. Amen. So my challenge for everyone here today and anyone who watches this video in the future is to understand that God can take you as an ordinary person and use you to accomplish extraordinary results if you're just willing to surrender to Him and be obedient and faithful to the opportunities that He will provide to you as He's provided to me. I'm no more special than you are to God. I'm just as ordinary as you are. But God has used me since I retired in an extraordinary way by sharing the gospel presentation I'm going to be sharing with you and having a lot of people pray to receive Christ. But in addition, even the people who aren't praying to receive Christ, I am a seed sower. You are seed sowers. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict the person of sin. It's the Holy Spirit's job to prepare their hearts before we engage in a conversation with them. So you can take a deep breath if one of your concerns about sharing your faith is being rejected by someone. That's not your job. Your job is to sow the seed and to be faithful to the opportunity that God presents to you, right? So... Um, you're going to need to know four things, only four things. If you know these four things, you can be as effective as I am at sharing the gospel. Now, it'll probably take you some failures, some attempts, right? The first time I ever shared the gospel was in law school in 1984. I went to the University of California Law School, and down the hall, it's in the middle of San Francisco, gay pride was pretty prominent. One of the law students was gay. And I went and shared the gospel with them. And I remember I didn't know what to tell them. I had become a Christian in May. This is August of 1984. I don't know how to present the gospel. I don't even know what the gospel was, except when I had read it in Power for Living a few months earlier, right? So I failed miserably. 
So expect to fail some, to fail forward, okay? Fail forward, and each time you try, and each time you make the presentation, right, you're going to see that it's becoming more natural to you, and of course you're going to have the Holy Spirit help to lead you and guide you, okay? So these are the four things you need to know. I think almost all of you can pass the, this, this quiz, all right? Number one... Do you know what happened on Good Friday? Yes. Does anybody here not know what happened on Good Friday? Question number two. Do you know what happened on Easter Sunday? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Number three. Do you know who Adam and Eve were and what happened to them? Yes. Wow. What a, we got a smart group here. <laughs> now the last thing you need to know is a Bible verse. John 3.16. Does anybody here not know John 3.16? And if you don't know John 3.16, you can actually Google it or open it in the Bible, right? For God so loved the world, etc. That's it. If you know those four things and you use this presentation and the order and the manner that I've kind of fine-tuned with God's help, of course, you can start leading people to Christ over the phone and in person. Over the phone and in person. So, what I'm going to be discussing today, I'll give you an overview. Why should we witness? Why we don't witness? Our role as seed sowers, the Holy Spirit's role, preparing hearts, and then the presentation itself, right? So, as part of the presentation itself, I've given you a handout. The side that I have up is examples, right? It says, most memorable examples of people praying to receive Christ. I want to give you a lay of the land to, for you to understand that where you are out in the world in everyday life, God presents opportunities, brings people into your life that you can share the gospel with, right? So today, while preparing for this, I'm taking a walk along the, the water in my subdivision. There's a landscaper, and he's trimming a tree. What did I say? I said, hey, you know what? I have a presentation to give this afternoon, and I was wondering if you could help me if I could practice what I'm going to say with you. And I went through and gave him the presentation, right? Now, at the end of the presentation, he says, so he said, do you know for sure if you're going to go to heaven? He said, no. Then I went through the presentation. At the end, at the end, he said, well, I know all that, but I'm still not sure if I'm going to go to heaven. And the, his phone rang, and he, he went on to do something different, right? So I planted another seed, right? I planted another seed in that person's heart. Who knows what God's going to do between today and tonight at the dinner table or, you know, weeks and months ahead. I did what I was called to do. He didn't pray to receive Christ because he believes he already knows Jesus. Well, you're going to come and run into all kinds of people. Our job is to just share, share these four things in the manner that I'm going to tell you to share them in because it's just been so effective, okay? All right, so why we don't witness? Fear of rejection. So why we should witness? Well, let's go why we should witness. I better read stuff from the top. Okay, so Jesus commands it. Go make disciples. Winning someone to Christ is the first step. Two, we should be grateful. We should be so grateful that God, Jesus died for us, right? <laughs> Suffered this extraordinarily painful death, right? He bled drops of blood praying in the Garden of Gethsemane just thinking about what was going to happen. Then the Old Testament says he was beaten beyond recognition and then he was tortured even more when he was crucified, right? Jesus did that so that you can spend eternity in heaven forever with him. If you shouldn't be grateful about that, what can we be grateful for in life, right? Just the fact that we've passed from death to life should be a motivating factor. You've probably heard the phrase, I'm a beggar with an empty cup showing someone else, right? Mm -hmm. to, to know the Lord, to, to share with another beggar, right? So we should be grateful in our hearts that we're going to heaven and we should have compassion for the lost people around us 
that we don't want them to go to hell, right? So the Bible says in John 13, by this they will know you are my disciples, a Christ follower, if you have love for one another, right? Well, a way to, to show love to somebody is if you know they're going to hell, you know, it's different than opening up a door for somebody, helping a little old lady across the street, right? You should, you should share the gospel with them when all of these opportunities will present themselves if you keep your eyes and ears open, okay? And then number four, on top of all of this, we're commanded to do it. We should be grateful to do it. We should care about other people. God says, you know what? Even though you're obligated to do it, I'm going to reward you if you do do it. We're going to have eternal rewards in heaven for sharing the gospel. Can it get any better than that? Hey, I command you to do it. And if you do it, I'm going to reward you. It's a fantastic deal, right? Amen. 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 So why don't we witness? So one is fear of rejection. And two is we don't feel equipped, right? So when I was in San Francisco in 1984, I was not equipped. But God had just given me that desire in the heart. So when I failed, I got up, I dusted off my shoes, I probably did a little reading, and then got back in the batter's box, right? So you go to the Hall of Fame batting what, 300? Certainly 333. They strike out a lot of times, right? They get a lot of outs. The same is going to be true for us. So the truth is that if you start to share the gospel using this approach, very few people push back. They push back. They don't push back. Why? Because you're asking them the two most important questions because you want them to know for sure they're going to go to heaven. How offensive can that be? This person is asking me these questions because his motive or her motive is for me to go to heaven. Now, there are a small percentage of people who don't like God and are anti-Christians or whatever, right? So there's a small percentage of people out there, but it's a small percentage. You would be shocked at how few people push back. And the biggest pushback I've gotten is I'm talking to Paul and witnessing to him, and this guy over here who hates what I'm saying, he gets in the conversation. He can't help himself. Right? So you've had that situation. It's not usually the person you're talking to. If the person you're talking to doesn't want you to tell them about what you're telling them, they usually, in a civilized society, verbalize that, and then you just respect their request, and you shut up and you move on, right? There's, there's no friction. There's Nothing's going to happen, right? They disagree with you. You've expressed your opinion. You just move on, right? So about 20% of the people, and I'll, I'll share, because most of the time that I share the gospel with people, I do it not the full-blown that I'm going to share with you, which you often get to do over the phone even more frequently than you do in person, right? But it's just having this track available, and I'm going to do a short presentation as if you're going through the checkout stand at a grocery store, right? Or Target, or Home Depot, or Lowe's. I've led people to the Lord in all of those situations. But most of the times, if there's a customer behind you, you have to respect that other person doesn't want to wait in line to overhear you talking about sharing the gospel, right? That's kind of rude. So, and I'll, I'll, I'll do it. So you share it quickly, right? And then you use the track, and you leave the track with them. Then it's the Holy Spirit's job, right, to convict them of their need for forgiveness, right? It's not our job. So about 20% of the people that I will share one of these tracks with will say thank you, whether they believe, they don't believe. And if, if I share the gospel with someone who's a Christian, I take out one of these tracks and I say, will you find someone, one person, to share this with? So now I'm leveraging myself through this other person to hopefully that they will find someone to share this with, right? I can't talk to everybody. All right, so that's 
that's another thing. But about 20% of the people literally say thank you, and less than 5% are going to push back. And the vast majority of those do it in a very polite way. Just say, hey, I'm not into what you're into. And then you just move on, right? It's no big deal. It's no big deal. OK, so our role, our role is seed sowers, right? We need to be faithful to opportunity. When we stand before Jesus, his standard is he's going to, we want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, right? So it's faithfulness to opportunity, right? So after you leave today and after you watch this message, my prayer is that your eyes and ears will be open in a different way to all of the opportunities you will have to share the gospel with people. Like walking along the path and seeing this person trimming a tree and saying, hey, the Holy Spirit prompt me. Why don't you just go share your presentation with them? Now, would I have thought of that three years ago? No, I probably wouldn't. But now as I see the Holy Spirit working in people's lives, I'm much more attuned, right? I'm much more attuned to these opportunities to be faithful to, to respond to. Okay, so we're seed sowers. So God is no respecter of persons, right? You can do what I'm doing, okay? You can do, and that's ordinary people can do extraordinary things. I'm no more extraordinary than anybody in this room, right? You can do what I'm doing. And I've got, so the good news, the good news for everybody is that I am going to show you the way that God has used, right, taught me the bad news. The bad news is now that you are going to know this additional information, God is going to hold you to a higher standard of faithfulness because you're now going to be equipped, and that can't be an excuse for you anymore, to not use the time and talents and treasures that you have for Jesus' glory. Right? Okay, so the Holy Spirit's role is to prepare the hearts and to convict of sin. Right? The Holy Spirit brings the increase. We sow the seeds. So again, take a deep breath. The pressure is not on you to convert anybody, right? So that's another reason why if when you're engaging with people, if there's ever any friction, you know, it's a good thing to just cease the conversation, right? A soft answer turns away wrath, right? A soft answer turns away wrath. So if you get a little friction, you just walk away, right? You end the conversation. There's nothing wrong with that. That's part of life, right? Hello, we live on planet Earth. Those things are gonna happen. So don't be afraid. Expect that that will happen on occasion. And when it does, right, just shake the, the, the dirt off of your sandals, your wallabies or your sneakers and move on, right, and move on. Okay, so presentation. The two most important questions in life. So what I've done, as I, as I have on, the, on one side, I want to go through those first because I did print out for you on the back side, right, the presentation that I give. I'm going to try to do it right off the seat of my pants. I've done it pretty frequently. So I've titled it, My Most Memorable Examples of People Praying and Receive Christ. Now I will say that after I typed this list up, I came up with more memorable things. So I've, I've left the list as it is, but the list could change the more I think about it, right? So I brought with me taxi cab driver, Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. He takes me to a restaurant. When I'm in the car, I'm sharing the gospel with the taxi driver. My best estimate was about 2005, right? So I share the gospel, and he prays to receive Christ. And then he emphatically, emphatically looks me in the eye and he like says, God sent you to me. That has had a lasting impact on my life, right? So I made this photo, right? I printed it out. I put it in a frame. It's on my dresser. It kind of matches the color of my dresser. And this has been a reminder to me for 17 years 
that God had a purpose and a plan for my life when I was vacationing in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, to get in this guy's taxi, and God had prepared his heart, and the taxi cab driver confirmed to me that God sent you to me. He says, God sent you to me. That's powerful, right? That is powerful. I've never forgotten it, and it's a reminder for me. I keep it in my bedroom that God has a purpose and a plan for my life. He's no respecter of persons. He has a purpose and plan for your life that now includes being here today, learning how to share the gospel for you to be a soul winner in his kingdom for his glory. Okay? So welcome to the club. Welcome to the club. All right, so that was number one. So, and I'm just estimating, 2005 probably was that year, and about 2008. So I used to lead volunteers at my church to deliver hundreds of presents to children of, of prisoners at Angel Tree Ministry. And in one particular, so I'd share the Christmas story, so it was different than what I'm going to share with you. But at the end, the gist was to turn the conversation to Jesus Christ, us being sinners, Jesus came to die for the sins of the world and then share in the gospel. And in one of the instances, many, many, many instances in these houses, two people, three people, four people would pray to receive Christ all the time. But in one house, there was 18 people in this tiny apartment. It was tiny. And we were all in the little kitchen area and it was overflowing. So that was just memorable to me, right? All right, 2017. Technically, this doesn't belong on here because the person didn't pray to receive Christ. But what happened is, so I'm, I'm flying from Lisbon back to Madrid, and I'm going to fly from Madrid back to the United States. I had been in Barcelona. We had business meetings in another town. And so I'm flying back, and Portuguese is different than Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. So I know some Spanish, but he knew some English, and his English was way better than my Portuguese, right? Way better than my Portuguese. But we had a conversation. I gave him a business card. I talked to him about Jesus. So here's my rule of thumb. If you're on a plane, you figure out where, how long it's going to take to get to your destination. You subtract a half an hour. And for that time, if you can engage the person or persons in a conversation next to you, you just talk to them about them. That's their number one topic that they want to talk about, right? And then, after you've shown you've taken an interest in them for the hour, two hours, whatever it is, when you switch the conversation, in most instances, you've earned their respect for them to listen to you. Now, they may reject you right away because how strong they believe, but you've earned the right to start, to start a conversation to talk to them. In this case, you're going to talk to them about Jesus, right? So in this case, I talked to the guy. I gave him my business card. Never heard from him. Didn't get his business card. He didn't have one. I remember asking for it. A year later, a year later, this guy calls me. You, the Holy Spirit is working on this guy a year later. So I got a call, we had a conversation, I sent them a follow-up email. I didn't hear back from them, but I did my job, right? I did what I was called to do. That's all I could do under the circumstances. So it's not always about someone praying to receive Jesus and now I can add a notch to my belt and no, it's what am I called to do under the circumstances with the person that's in front of me, right? Okay. Um, Purdue, 2019. So in 2019, I'm up in Indiana. At that point, I, I think I was living in Carmel, which is the roundabout capital of the world. And actually, the Guinness World Book of Records for roundabout driving is in Carmel. Not Carmel, like California. So uh, one day, God got impressed upon me to go to IU, Indiana University, and go witness up there. And another day, to go to Purdue, right? Purdue Boilermakers. So when I'm on the Purdue campus, I meet some Portuguese students. Classes were over, and it was one, two, or three days, and, and kids were getting out of their dorms and all and going back, you know, leaving the campus. And so I led a guy who spoke Portuguese 
and I don't know how he possibly took exams in English. His English, my Portuguese might have been almost as good as his English. His, his English was not very good. But at the end of it, he prayed to receive Christ. So the person didn't even speak my language. And somehow the Holy Spirit was able to use that opportunity, right? To win a soul to him. 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven, now, now we're here. Now we're in VR. I've, I've fast-forwarded here. We're in VR. 7-Eleven, I've probably led about 12 people to Christ last year at 7-Eleven, about half inside the store and half outside the store. Some of them are employees. Some of them are customers, right? So in this case, there's two golf carts outside. One golf cart is a gas-powered cart, and it needs to fill up the golf cart. And her girlfriend, so these are two high school girls from Vieira High School. So one has a battery powered, one has a gas powered. So I just got prompted to go up and start chit-chatting with these two girls, right? Filling up their gas tank. So in that conversation, as I'm sharing with the one that's closest to me, it ends up by God's sovereignty, that she doesn't know the Lord, and unbeknownst to me, her girlfriend, who has the battery-powered cart, is a Christian. So I discover that the one's a Christian, as I'm sharing with her friend, she's kind of nodding along, right? So what do I do? I get her involved in the conversation, and at the end, her girlfriend prays to receive the Lord, pumping gas. I was up at UCF for graduations, last May and I'm getting gas at a 7-Eleven that's not too far from the campus usually I try to pull up next to someone who's pumping gas on the other side of the same pump and try to strike up the conversation and lead them to the Lord right well in this case I was pumped way over here and this other pump was way over there but I got prompted so I walk over and I talk to this guy and sure enough, he prays to receive the Lord pumping gas at 7-Eleven. So when you pull in for gas, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, there's an opportunity. The person, if they're not inside getting something, they're just sitting out there twiddling their thumbs waiting for that gas pump to stop pumping, right? You've got a window of opportunity to plant some seeds, right? Gas stations should look different to you now than they did before, right? So whether it's a Wawa, a Cumberland Farms, a 7-Eleven, just a straight gas station, those are opportunities for you. All right. Coca -Coca, um, Cocoa Beach. Cocoa Beach, the beach has become one of my favorite, most fruitful places to witness one-on-one, -on -one, okay? So Cocoa Beach... At the, like January 3rd, it's like January 3rd or 4th, I'm doing my Cocoa Beach evangelism, and there's a big group. So I'll just say as a, as a general rule, big groups are harder to witness to than one person individually. And if it's two people, the one person is often more cognizant, aware of what might the other person think if I pray to receive Jesus with this guy, right? So they're self-conscious of, of someone. So the larger the group, the more difficult it is. Well, it just so happened that I got prompted to go up to this large group, and there's many large groups I walk past and don't get prompted to go to. Um, and as I'm sharing the gospel, I'm seeing, so there's about four or five teenage girls, and there's about seven adults, eight adults. So there's a big group, and they're spread out, and there's three girls that are right on a blanket together, right? So they're, the, they're my focus. And what, what ends up happening is, is the parents start chiming in with me and become part of the presentation and become part of affirming what I'm sharing with them. And at the end of that presentation, all three girls prayed to receive the Lord, right? So it's statistically small but with God anything's possible right with God anything's possible okay perhaps my favorite it's hard the two that I have number seven and number 14 are probably at this point my co-favorites okay so I'm, I'm at Indy Atlantic Beach so if you like good pizza Sabaros 
is right at the street where the Indian Atlantic boardwalk is. It's a small little boardwalk, right? And they have public parking and, and a restroom right adjacent to it, um, behind it. So I like to go down to Indian Atlantic Beach and just kind of, on the boardwalk, there's seven benches carved into the, like, seating, and the rest of it is a wood rail that you can lean up against and look at the ocean. It's a nice view. It's a, it's a nice spot to just hang out on this little boardwalk. So on this particular day, there was two separate couples who prayed to receive Christ, and I'm just moving along down, down this boardwalk. I get to the end, and there's a daughter and a mother Mother's about 35, the daughter's about 15. So I'm gonna give away part of my presentation now, although I did with the four, the four things you needed to know, right? So when I say to the mom and the daughter, are you familiar with Good Friday? No. Are you familiar with Easter Sunday? No. Are you familiar with the phrase that Jesus died for the sins of the world? No. How about Adam and Eve? Let's try Adam and Eve. Have you heard of Adam and Eve? No. No. So that has never happened, right? That had never happened before, and it's only it's been a short while ago, so it hasn't happened since. So I am dumbfounded. I freeze, right? And I literally say, God, what do I do? What do I do? Like this is I've never had this. I've never dealt with this. So the Holy Spirit prompted me to just teach them, just go through the presentation even though they don't know anything. So just tell them what happened on Good Friday. Tell them what happened on Easter Sunday. Tell them Jesus died for the sins of the world, right? Tell them about John 3.16. And I did. And then, after I did that, it's like, okay, Lord, what do I do now? And I had never done this before. I'm, I'm really, I'm embarrassed to admit it now. Now I do it more often. But at the time, I had never, like, used the track to point the person to, to, there's a prayer in here, which we'll go through this, right? There's a prayer in here. So I basically, after I said everything, they know nothing. They know nothing. So I take this, and I put it in the, in the 15-year-old's hands first. And I say, read this and tell me if you can agree with it. And it's a sinner's prayer that basically says, I'm a sinner, I deserve hell. You know, I put my faith alone in Christ alone in Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, right? Then I give the other one to the mother. Well, it didn't take the kid like five seconds, ten, you know, as fast as she could possibly read. Like, kind of even before, like, how fast did that happen? She says, yes. Yes, I can pray that. <laughs> I was blown away, right? I'm blown away. Then the mom says, so it's, you got a kid, your parent, you know, you got this dynamic of two people being self-conscious. The mother says, I can pray with two, I agree. So I prayed a prayer. Both of them prayed to receive the Lord, although they knew nothing about anything. That is miraculous, right? So when the Bible says nothing is impossible for God, that's as good of an example as you could get. So maybe that's my favorite. I think even when I tell the next one, it can't get better than that. All right? All right. So then, so now negative circumstances. Excuse me, Lance. I wasn't sure if you were going to try to get to the back page or not. That's 12 Oh, wow. Okay. So let's go, let's go to the back real fast. Wow, I didn't realize it went that fast. Okay, so the short presentation, I'm going through the supermarket. Hey, how you doing? This just happened yesterday. Um, I'm in line, and then two other cashiers come on board after I've waited in line. So I joke with the, with the cashier like, hello. Now that I get in line and, and you're the first person, you got two other cashiers that are help other people. And I say it in a nice, funny way, and she laughed and all, and you connect with them. And then I just ask the two questions in life. If you die tonight, you know for sure if you'll go to heaven. 
And then two, if you stood before God and he asked you why should he let you to heaven, what would you say? Right? So I think she didn't know. So then you just real quickly take this brochure out and say, well, the reason I ask is because I want you to know for sure. And this pamphlet describes it for you, right? So one, you can know for sure. Two, we've all sinned, and our sin separates us from God. I might add, that's why Jesus died for the sins of the world, right? Sin, sin has a penalty, and Jesus paid the penalty. Number five, you need to believe on Jesus. You need to put your faith alone in Christ alone in Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins, not your own good works. And there's a prayer here that you can pray if you turn your heart to God, that God will forgive you. Boom. You just leave it with the person and you leave. That's it. 30 seconds, 40 seconds, 30, 40 seconds, and it's over. You've planted the seed. You don't have much time. Okay. So, on the phone... You've, you've called customer service somewhere, a bank, a credit card company, supermarket, something's happened. They take care of your problem for you, and at the end of the call, they usually say either, one, is there any other questions I can answer, and two, is there any other way I can be of help? So then you say, well, you know, because you've been of help to me, I'd like to be of help to you. Right? I like to ask people what I think are the two most important questions in life. Number one, if you die tonight. Number two, if they say I'm a good person, then I'll ask the rhetorical question, well, if good people go to heaven, then why did Jesus have to die for the sins of the world? Most people know that Jesus died for the sins of the world. Again, it's a lot more people now to say they're not sure. So I say, well, the reason I ask is because I want you to know for sure, right? You want them to feel like, hey, you're on their team, right? So then you say, are you familiar with Good Friday, the significance of Good Friday, okay? On Good Friday, Jesus was crucified. The Bible says, he who had no sin became sin for us so that through him we could inherit the righteousness of God and be forgiven, right? Um, then you say, are you familiar with Easter Sunday, right? Then your response, we have to do a fast here. Um, say, well, what happened on Easter Sunday is Jesus rose from the dead and he proved he had power over sin and death and that when you die and I die, he can raise us up from the dead, right? You say, Jesus' resurrection is the most important event in the history of mankind and that's why we have B.C. and A.D., Okay, then you, you turn to Adam and Eve. Are you familiar with who Adam and Eve are? Okay, how many sins did Adam and Eve commit? One sin, right? Before they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, one sin. How many sins do you and I have to commit before we're separated from God? Only one sin, right? The Bible says, he who had no sin, Jesus, he became sin for us, he took our place, so that through him we could inherit the righteousness of God, right? Then you say, God demonstrated his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. By dying for us, we can be reconciled back to God by being forgiven. Then you go into John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, right? Then you focus on, <clears throat> he gave, right? It's a gift, it's free, we can't earn it. We don't deserve it, right? So, um, then, then you transition into, I'm drawing a blank here with those sp speeding things up, okay? So then you say, I know, so now you try to take the pressure off them, right? Because there's a little bit of pressure here, kind of building, in a sense, right? You say, I know that I'm going to heaven for sure, not because of who I am and what I've done, but because of who Jesus is and what he's done then it's really important to say the next thing. I'm no better than you, and I'm no more deserving than you are. You're not this self-righteous religious fanatic preaching to them, telling them how bad they are, right? And how implicitly righteous you are. Right? So, then I say, I've, and, and I'll often say, 
If I gave you $1,000 and put it in a Christmas card and you put it under the tree, but after Christmas, when all of the gift wrappings were thrown away, they accidentally threw away the $1,000, would you have received the benefit of my gift? No. Well, although Jesus died for the sins of the world, not everybody is going to heaven because not everybody has received his free gift, right? So I know that I'm going to heaven for sure because I've received the free gift of forgiveness by humbling myself before God, admitting that I'm a sinner, asking God to forgive me, telling him I'm sorry for my sin, asking him to forgive me, and putting my faith alone in Christ alone, in Jesus' crucifixion, which we would have described, and his resurrection, which we described, and not my own good works. And not my own good works, right? So then you say, is there any reason why, right here and now, you wouldn't want to receive God's free gift of forgiveness? And I have to say, it's not even on this list here. I, I put it in in writing, but five people at Aspen Dental, right? So when you need some teeth cleaning or dental work, God can use that. Health first receptionist. When I said that to the health first receptionist when I was getting x-rays for my hip surgery, she looked at me and she was like, who wouldn't want to receive it? Like, and that's, the, that's what response everybody should give, right? Who wouldn't want to receive this free gift of forgiveness? Okay, So then you say, well, I would like to have the privilege of leading you in a prayer between you and God. It has nothing to do with me. Will you ask him to forgive you for your sins, right? And to put your faith alone in Christ alone and not your own good works. Okay? Are you ready to do that? Yes, I'm ready to do that. Okay. So I want to let you know that in a, in a split second, right, the Bible says you're going to go from being spiritually dead to spiritually alive. You'll become a new creation. And that when that happens... Okay, you're going to start to grow, you know, and you're going to be on the, I like to say it's the beginning of the beginning, right? You're going to start a new life. And then I'll say, what happened to me is, God gave me a desire to live my life for him, so that almost 39 years later, right, I'm still sharing with people like you. So then you do the prayer, and you say, Dear God, dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. Say, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for my sins. I put my faith alone. I put my faith alone in Christ alone, in Christ alone, in his resurrection, in his crucifixion, rather, in his resurrection, not my own good works. Please forgive me now. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, and give me a desire to live my life for you. Amen. Right? So after that, then if, if it's over the phone, I try to tell them, hey, I'd like to share a, a few Bible verses with you. If you could just take another minute to write these down, right? So, so then I use what's on the back of the, of the track here, right? John 14, 6, Titus 3, 4, and 5, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Then I, then I say, you should read, God wants a relationship with you. Relationship is communication. When you read the Bible, it's God talking to you. When you pray, it's you talking to God. Highly recommend you start with the book of John. It's an up-close personal biography of Jesus' life, his love, his compassion, his miracles, his relationship with the disciples, washing his disciples' feet, the Last Supper, his crucifixion and resurrection. Right? Then I also say there's now movies that you can watch online for free, about two and a half hours for the book of John. It really comes to life for you. So I'd encourage you to do that as well. Right? And then, typically, that's all you can do. So with a, with a person, and a lot of times over the phone, banks, any big corporation, they don't let people give out their phone numbers. So it's not even worth asking them, right? Now, if it's someone local, you know, some, some shoe shine shop or a deli or something, that person, you know, you can ask them for their email address and then send a follow-up email, right? Get that information. And I, you know, I have a follow-up email that I send out. So I have my contact information on here, my phone number and my email. My commitment to God is anyone who's willing to share these, I will pay for, okay? In whatever quantity that you use, you know, I've bought about 4,000 now since I retired, 
I've given away close to that. Um, but it's a great tool, and that's the seed sowing. You just share that brief gospel message, and then you can leave that with someone, okay? So thank you very, any time for questions? Any time for questions? Brian? Um, I, I just wanted to thank you for that presentation. It's, it's, it's going to challenge us all, and I think we're up to the challenge. So much appreciated.